When I was a little boy, I loved putting models together. Model cars, model planes, model boats. On one occasion, I put together a 500-piece aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, I used one part of a two-part epoxy mix. And it didn't work. That boat didn't float and those planes did not fly. I love putting models together and I love putting puzzles together. And if you know anything about a child putting a puzzle together, you know there's something that you need and that is the picture on the box. The picture on the top of the box is an example. It's a snapshot of what things ought to look like when you get finished doing what you're designed to do. And in a very similar way, the New Testament writers sometimes seem to pull over and give us brief snapshots, some still photos of what the ministry of Christ looked like. And I find one such snapshot right here in these three verses. So as we resume our study of Matthew's gospel, chapter 4 places us still very early in the ministry of Jesus. In our last lesson, now about a month ago, Jesus had just called the first four of his 12 disciples. So we are still very early in the ministry of Christ. And yet in this little picture, just under a hundred words in my Bible, we see a beautiful picture of the ministry of Jesus. And I submit this morning, it is not only a model for this church collectively, it's a good role model for your life individually. In the home, in the workplace, in the classroom, on the ball field, wherever it is that life takes you, we should model our life's ministry after the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And I want to look at these three verses this morning and examine three aspects of Christ's ministry. First of all, let's listen to his preaching. Now, Jesus Christ was a lot of things when he walked on the earth. He was an example, a miracle worker, a sacrifice, a sin bearer, but at the top of the list, he was a teacher. And beyond that, he was a preacher. And today, we need to incline our ear to the text and listen to the preaching of Jesus. Now, there are a lot of people who think they know what good preaching is. One person said, I can tell you what good preaching is like. It's got a captivating introduction, a compelling conclusion, and those two things are about 15 minutes apart from one another. Well, I'm going to do a little more than that, but I want us to listen to Jesus preaching and examine three things about it. I want us to consider where he preached, what he preached, and even how he preached. As we consider where he preached, I want you to notice with me his dedication to the house of God. Verse 23 begins by saying, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Now, if you know the ministry of Jesus, he preached in a lot of different places. He preached in fields. He preached on mountainsides. He preached on boats. He preached in homes. And yes, he preached in the synagogue. And that's where we find him today because Jesus fulfilled and obeyed the commands of God. And so on the Sabbath day, as his apostles would later do, Jesus made his way to the synagogue. The synagogue was the center of life for the Jews, culturally, socially, and religiously. In New Testament language, we would say that Jesus went to church because as one who obeyed the commands of his Father, he went to the appointed place on the appointed day with the appointed people for the appointed purpose. God's people had gathered at God's house for God's word to be preached for God's glory. Did you know, have you ever considered that Jesus was committed to the corporate gathering of God's people? Writing about this same dedication to the house of God, Luke records this same time frame in the ministry of Jesus and tells us in Luke chapter 4 verse 16, that Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his, what's that next word underlined? As his custom was. That word could be rightly translated as his practice was, as his habit was. Dare I use the word discipline? As his discipline was. Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Right time, right place, 
stood up to read the Scripture for the right purpose. Now that raises a question for us this morning. Jesus, as God come in the flesh, was the sure fulfillment of the law in which we stand. That's what we just sang a moment ago, and we sang it right. But humanly speaking, where did Jesus learn that? The Bible says in Luke 2.52 that that Jesus grew in wisdom and strength. Where, Where did Jesus learn, humanly speaking, a commitment to the house of God? He learned it from his mama and from his earthly father. Luke 2.27, speaking of a prophet named Simeon, says of the circumcision of Jesus that that he came by the Spirit into the temple and the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the, there's that word again, according to the what? Custom of the law. Luke 2.42 puts it this way, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to, there it is again, according to the custom of the feast. God in his sovereign plan placed the Lord Jesus Christ not only in the womb of a young virgin, but placed him in the home of a woman of God and a man of God who didn't at that time, I think, fully understand everything about that boy, but they understood this. God has given us a child, and we want to raise that child in what Paul would later call the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. My testimony would be simple. When I was growing up, there were two questions. I never asked my mama and I never asked my daddy. I never asked them, do you love me? And I never not one time on Saturday night asked them, are we going to church tomorrow? There are several reasons I'm faithful to the things of God. At the top of the list is just God's grace. I testify with Paul that if there's any good in me, it's not me but Christ. But there are a couple of earthly reasons. One is named Duell. That's my daddy. And the other one's named Mary. And they raised us in fellowship with God's people, God's Word, and God's house. Mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, grand, grand, big daddy, listen carefully. If you want your child or your grandchild to grow up to be a little more like Jesus... There are practical and theological reasons that it will not happen without a dedication to the house of God. Jesus preached. And his preaching ministry, if you'll listen to it and learn from it, speaks of a dedication to the house of God. Secondly, there's a declaration of the Word of God. Jesus didn't show up to give his opinion, although if he had given his opinion, it would have still been good. He opened up the book of God. And the Bible says in verse 23, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Teaching and preaching. The Holy Ghost uses both words. Now, in our vernacular, we tend to say that all teaching is preaching and all preaching is teaching. There's a sense in which that is true. But the Holy Spirit actually uses two different words, teaching and preaching. You say, Brother Mike, what's the difference in teaching and preaching? Preaching is when you teach but can't talk the next day. (laughs) No, that's not what it means. Teaching, in this case, gives us our word for instruction or indoctrination. It literally speaks of dividing something, of cutting it straight. Uh, Paul would tell young Timothy to rightly divide or properly handle the word of truth. The idea here is that you cut a straight line with laser-like precision. That's, That's what good teaching does. Listen to me, child of God. Good teaching draws some lines. Good Bible teaching says everything on this side of the line is right and everything on that side of the line is wrong. And I don't have to tell you, the world doesn't like teaching like that these days. Because if the world wants to act like there's no king and we all do what is right in our own eyes, nobody wants to be told that this is right and that is wrong because some of the stuff that I'm wanting to do may be something that's wrong. But Jesus still cut a straight line and taught the people uh, some of the criticisms that you will receive. 
I receive it. Our church receives it. If you share the gospel in the workplace, in the home, in the community, you'll hear this criticism. That doctrine divides. Let's just all come together and sing kumbaya, Brother Mike. Doctrine divides. You bet your bottom dollar doctrine divides. It divides fact from fiction, truth from error. It divides opinion from the Bible. It divides right from wrong. And this word teaches us that our preaching ministry as a church not only involves the way that I speak, but it involves the way that you listen. You ought to be like the Bereans were in Acts 17, 11. There, the Bible comments on those ancient believers and said they received the word with readiness. Not, not, not with skepticism or criticism, but readiness. Listen, friend, they didn't come to church trying to hear something wrong. They went to God's house trying to hear if something was right. And the Bible says they search the Scriptures every day to see if those things were so. I have told you so many times in my ministry, there's only one man that you ought to loyally follow without question, and his name is Jesus Christ. Anybody else, from the pastor to the Sunday school teacher to the staff member, you don't take their word for it unless they can show you the word for it. And that's called teaching. And it involves proclamation of God's Word, and it involves you listening with spiritually receptive ears and spiritually receptive hearts. But the Bible not only says that Jesus did some teaching, it says He did some preaching. And that is an entirely different word. It's the Greek word kataruso. In our day, we'd say He just reared back and preached. In South Georgia, we say he, he shucked the corn. He shelled the peas. He dusted off a spot and just preached. When Jesus preached, the people of his day said, never a man spake like that man. We say it like this. I ain't ever heard preaching like that before. Jesus was a great preacher. And while the word for teaching implies teaching and listening and teaching and dissecting and back and forth and back and forth. The word here for preaching, caruso, just connotes one action. It's just a flat-out declaration of truth. You teachers know what it's like, Sunday school teacher, school teacher, mamas teaching homeschoolers around the table. You know that you share the truth when you're teaching, and you look for the facial expression. You, you, you want to see, it, 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 is, is somebody not getting it? And if you see that look, you back up and you, you dig a little deeper. You, you know there's more teaching to do there. But in preaching, this word is not concerned about whether you get it or not. It's not concerned, listen out, with whether you agree with it or not. It ain't the least bit concerned with whether you like it or not. It's just a declaration of truth. Leon Morris comments on this Greek word and says, This preaching is not the systematic instruction indicated by teaching, but rather it's a forthright proclamation, a setting forth of certain facts, whether people want to take notice of them or not. Now, I do not think that our Lord had a, I don't care if you believe it or receive it kind of attitude, and today's preachers and teachers shouldn't either. But I do think this word preaching speaks of the fact that whether you agree with it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you want more of it or not, is not going to change what I preach because I'm not preaching ultimately for your approval. Jesus did some teaching. He did some preaching. And if you're going to model your life's ministry after the ministry of the Lord, you got to come to a place you're dedicated to the house of God and you embrace and you are willing to share the Word of God even in a culture that will largely and overwhelmingly reject it. There's a third thing we notice about his preaching, and that is his demonstration of the power of God. Verse 23 concludes, And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. In a day before the completed canon of Scripture, 
Jesus did what his apostles would later do. He validated the message of his preaching with signs and wonders. John MacArthur, preaching on this text, labels his message the king's divine credentials. Because to a Jewish audience, the performance of these signs and wonders was a messianic calling card. When someone came performing these miracles, it was the Messiah. Most notably in Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. The old prophet said, then, when the Messiah comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now let me interrupt for just a moment. To tell you, if you study the pages of your Old Testament, you'll see all kinds of miracles performed. I mean, rivers stalled and oceans parted, axe heads floated, donkeys spoke, gigantic walls fell over with a shout, lepers were cleansed by dipping in the dirty Jordan River. But you find in all the miracle after miracle after miracle, including the raising of the dead, not one single blind eye was ever opened in the Old Testament. Nobody opened blinded eyes until the Messiah came along. The opening of the eyes of the blind was a messianic credential. And when Jesus came, he opened the eyes of the blind. And he said, when that happens, Isaiah said, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame are going to leap, and the tongue of the dumb are going to sing. The performance of these signs and wonders should have told that crowd, you've got the Messiah on your hands. Let me show it to you in the ministry of John the Baptist. You've got your Bible open to Matthew. Turn over to chapter 11. It won't be on the screen, but turn over to Matthew chapter 11. This is an occasion where the prophesied forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, had doubt about the identity of the Lord. The one who had said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world is beset with doubt. The, the, the one who was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb because he came into the presence of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Lord Jesus in his mother's womb has doubt. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, they said unto him, these are John the Baptist's disciples, they said to Jesus, are you he that should come or should we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go back and tell John again those things which you do hear and see. Go back and tell John that the blind receive their sight. Tell John the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus said, If John the Baptist wants to know if I'm really the Messiah, you go back and tell him about the miracles you see me do, starting with the opening of the eyes of the blind. On the night before his death, in John 14, Jesus said to one of his disciples, you don't have to believe in me just because of my words. You can believe in me because of the work that you have seen me do. Now, what does this have to do with us today? Listen carefully, child of God. You want to see something that will turn southeast Georgia right side up with the power of the gospel? Let the people who live around this community see a group of people dedicated to the house of God, not hooking up your boat on Sunday morning, not posting pictures on Sunday afternoon of turkeys you killed or bucks that you dropped on Sunday morning. But they see a group of people that are dedicated to the house of God. And when they open their mouth, they are able to declare the truth of the Scripture. And when somebody says, is all that true? They can say, look at the evidence. Look at the proof. Look at the signs of a transformed life. The drunks have been dried up. The, the womanizers are faithful husbands. The lost have been found. The dead have been brought to spiritual life. Look at the change that Jesus has brought. Listen to his preaching. There's a second thing we need to see in this ministry model. We need to learn from his power. The three verses set before us here are, in many ways, an outline of the next five chapters of Matthew. Uh, here we find there, there's teaching, preaching, and healing. When we come back together, Matthew 5 begins with three chapters of teaching. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And then chapters 8 and 9 are just filled with a plethora of miraculous signs and wonders. 
But I want us to learn some things about the miracle working power of Jesus just from verse 24. And before we look at it more, more carefully, I want you to notice with me, there's evidence here that Jesus had power over the body, the spirit, and the mind. The body, the spirit, and the mind. Jesus was able to cure problems that were physical, spiritual, and even mental. Notice with me, first of all, that he cured diseases. Verse 24, we're back in Matthew 4, 24, and his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people, taken with divers diseases and torments. Can you blame them? Why is his fame spreading? He's healing all manner of diseases. If you think about it, if you had a sick child, a sick grandchild, or a sick friend, and you knew that Jesus was in the next town healing people, and you found out that he was able to heal whether it was a physical problem, a spiritual problem, or even an emotional, mental problem, I tell you what we'd be doing, we'd be loading up the vans to get over there to get in the presence of the Lord. Hey, I've got good news. Our omnipresent, everywhere present Lord is right here in the midst today. And his miracle working power has not been diminished, not one iota. And so they hear there's a miracle worker down in Galilee, and they come from all parts of the known world. He cured diseases. Wouldn't you like to have been there to see some of those things? If we limit our discussion just to the Gospel of Matthew, we come over to chapter 8 and we see our Lord cleanses a leper, heals a centurion's servant, casts devils out of two demoniacs, calms the sea, and feeds a multitude heals a multitude of sicknesses and diseases. In Matthew chapter 9, he heals a paralytic, gives sight to two blind men, meets a man who was mute, that is, he was unable to speak. But in that man's case, it was not because of a tongue problem, it was because of a demon problem. A demon had taken captivity of his tongue. Jesus rebuked the demon and the mute man began to speak. And then the crowd said, we've never seen any power like this in all of Israel. While the religious leader said, if he's got power over a demon, he must be the Lord of the demons. Jesus must be of the devil. And by the way, preaching about Jesus and the preaching of Jesus still divides crowds today. And it divided the crowds in Jesus' day. In Matthew 9, we read about the raising of Jairus' daughter and that woman with the issue of blood that touched the hem of his garment. Matthew puts it in his ninth chapter. In Matthew 12, he heals a man with a withered hand. Matthew 14, he feeds the 5,000, walks on water. And in Matthew 14, the Bible says that everybody who reached out and touched the hem of his garment was healed. Have you ever noticed in your Bible that miracle was not relegated to one woman with the issue of blood, but on at least one dynamic healing crusade, everybody said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, and everyone that did was immediately healed. Jesus Christ cured diseases, and the list could go on and on and on. I simply want to say in the interest of time, Jesus was, listen, friend, and he still is today the great physician. Hell had no power over him, and neither did sickness. Sin had no power over him, and neither did disease. The grave, hallelujah, had no power over Jesus, and neither would something like cancer. You say, well, if he has power over it today, why doesn't he always cure today? Why doesn't he always heal? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he does it in some cases and not in others. That's in the providence of God. But whether he does or not has nothing to do with the fact that he can. While I do not believe that any individual today has the spiritual gift of healing, Jesus Christ still does. He's still able to cure diseases. We don't often get on this subject, so this is as good a place of any for me to say that in a world where we thank God for doctors in medicine, 
We thank God for procedures and surgeries. That's a gift from God. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. I thank God for every doctor, every nurse, every technician, every pharmacist that ministers to people in time of sickness and disease. But child of God, let us never forget that God is the one who can And God is the one who still does touch and miraculously heal. He still cures diseases today. He did it then. He does it now. He cured diseases. We also see in verse 24, he commanded demons. Right in the middle of the verse, the Bible says, those who were possessed with devils, he healed them as well. Now, we live in a world that doesn't even want to talk about the existence of the devil. Maybe you heard about the time that the devil went to the Baptist church, walked down the center aisle to the front of the church, turned around and yelled, boo, and everybody ran for their life except one old codger sitting on the front row. The devil looked at him and said, I said, boo, aren't you scared of me? He said, no, I've been married to your sister for 57 years. But the Bible still teaches the reality of demonic spirits. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Our struggle is not a physical one, but a spiritual one. And there's something interesting you're going to see as we walk through the gospel of Matthew. Matthew More perhaps than the other gospel writers, tell us about occasions where Jesus healed a person of their physical sickness by rebuking the demon that was behind the sickness. Now, I need to be very clear here. Sometimes, would you say sometimes? Not all the time, but sometimes the physical problems that Jesus healed were not of themselves physical problems. The physical was a manifestation of a problem in the spiritual. And when you fix the problem with the spiritual, you automatically fix the problem in the physical. Some of you have high blood pressure, and it's not a blood problem. It's a spiritual problem. You need to cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. You need to to come unto Him all that are weary and are heavy laden and let Him give you some rest. Now, to be very clear, every sickness is not caused by a demon. I grew up in an environment where they rebuked a demon behind everything. You may not have a diabetes demon. You may have an uncontrolled appetite. You may not have a nicotine demon. It may be those two packs of Marlboro you smoke every day. Y'all don't have to say amen. I, I amen myself. You may not have a demon of cirrhosis. It may be that liquor that you've been drinking that's pickling your body. But sometimes, I said sometimes, what you see with your eyes may be a manifestation of something that you cannot see with your eyes. That was true in Jesus' day, and that truth has not changed. You say, Pastor, if it hasn't changed, why don't we see more demonic activity in our day? Who who told you we don't have any? The reason that we don't notice it as much may be our own spiritual ignorance. In Mark chapter 1, Mark telling this same time frame of Jesus says one of the demoniacs that, that was cured was in the synagogue in the midst of the people. But that demon didn't act up until Jesus came into the midst. It may be our own spiritual impotence and spiritual ignorance. Or it may be that the devil as a master deceiver and counterfeiter has learned how to adapt his manifestations. I mean, if somebody stood up in our church today and their head spun around and they spewed green stuff out of their mouth like something from a 1980s sci-fi movie and they were shouting praises to Lucifer, we'd say, "That's that's a demon. But that'd be too obvious. You know how I think demonic spirits show up today? They publish books and religious literature. They join the church and become good churchmen. Can I give you some application? When you meet somebody that says they're a Christian, but they're in favor of taking the lives of preborn children, you've just been in the presence of demonic deception. 
When you meet somebody who tries to tell you that you can walk with Jesus, be on your way to heaven while embracing the alphabet soup of LGBTQIA+, you've been in the presence of demonic activity. When you meet somebody that causes division and trouble in the Lord's church, I don't care how many Bible verses they can post on Instagram, I don't care what they may tell you, you've been in the presence of the work of the devil himself. And Jesus is still well able to command demons. He cured diseases. There's a third thing we notice. He conquered disabilities. I need to pay very close attention to what's happening at the end of verse 24. For the Bible says, And those who were lunatic and who had the palsy. Now that word lunatic in the King James, your Bible may render it as epilepsy. That word lunatic is not talking about teenagers. <laughs> Although if you've ever tried to raise a few, you may, you may dispute what I just said. The word might, might often apply. But I want you to think about that word lunatic. Uh, sometimes it would manifest as seizures, and it's why some scholars think that it's in reference to things like epilepsy. But I, I don't think that's the best rendering. Lunatic means you've got a tick, tick in the sense of some uncontrollable physical expression. You've got a tick that was created but caused by the luna, the moon. In this day, many of them thought that mental problems were caused by the influence and power of the moon. And so when someone had mental or severe emotional problems, they said they had a tick from the luna. They were luna. Ticks. This Greek word, you look it up yourself, it literally means to be struck by the moon. Now, in this case, moonstruck doesn't mean that you've met the love of your life and your head over heels. J.B. Phillips, in his translation of the Bible, renders this word as insane. Jesus met those who had mental problems. Jesus met those who had psychological problems emotional problems, and He healed all of them. Now, I wrote this in my notes because if you misquote me, I want you to, I want you to know I know what I'm saying today. I'm not telling anybody to stop taking their medicine, stop going to the doctor, stop seeing your Christian counselor. I, I am telling you, however, there is no condition at all that Jesus cannot touch. I'm telling you, we ought to pray for those who are oppressed and depressed and suppressed that Jesus would touch and Jesus would heal. Whether someone is suicidal or bipolar or clinically depressed or delusional out of their mind, I stop by to tell you, there is no part of our human existence that is untouched by sin. No part of our human existence undamaged by Adam's sin and the curse of the fall. And there is no part of our human existence that is beyond the powerful reach of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say it again lest I be misquoted. I'm not telling anybody, stop going to the doctor or the counselor or the pharmacy. I am saying that sometimes before you run to the medicine cabinet, maybe you ought to run to an altar of prayer and ask God to intercede. It may be that before you have an account, an appointment with Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz or even Dr. Dobson, maybe you need an appointment with Dr. Jesus, the great physician. And as a church, if we follow this model of ministry, if we're willing to get our hands dirty, ministering to and touching those who have all manner of problems, those whose body isn't right, those whose spirit isn't right, and those whose mind isn't right, you better be ready to scoot over and make some more room on your pew. Because they're around us everywhere, all day. The model for ministry, let's listen to his preaching. Let's learn from his power. Now, very quickly, let's look 
at his popularity. Matthew will tell us in picture and illustration that Jesus became very famous. Verse 25, there followed him great multitudes of people. From Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. In a few chapters, Matthew is going to tell us that Jesus took a sack lunch and fed 5,000 men. Some suggest that was just the men, and the crowd may have been upwards of 20,000 people. You know the only way that a preacher can, can feed 20,000 people after he preached is if 20,000 people came to hear him preach. I'd call that a mega church. Jesus was getting very, very popular. I believe what we're going to see here in his popularity is a contrast between what the world was looking for and what Jesus had actually come to do. Three things real quickly before we're done. I want you to consider where they originated. Where was this crowd from? A great multitude from Galilee and all these other places listed in verse 25. They're coming from everywhere. And once again, I want to say, I don't blame them. I've known chronic illness and sickness in my family, immediate family, and extended family. If you told me that the specialist is over there, that's where I'm getting to. You tell me the cure is over there, that's where we're going. In my own family, we've traveled all over the southeast because of doctors who said, I suggest you go there, I suggest you go there. And you know what we've always done every time? We've gotten over there. I don't blame them. They've heard there's a healer, and they come from all over the known region. The the Liberty Commentary in the late Jerry Falwell writes, this is no insignificant feat when one realizes that no prophet had arisen in Israel for over 400 years. They're not in the cultural practice of just piling up and all going to hear one man preach. And they come from all over the known region as a church with a regional impact. I'm talking to us. Did you know that every single Sunday when we gather, every Sunday there are six counties represented here? We have other families who come from two additional counties. So when everybody's here, we got eight counties represented here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I say again, if we will minister to hurting people, we'll never be at a loss for prospects. This passage teaches us that Jesus ministered to all kind of people with all kind of problems from all kind of places. Look right here. There are only two things necessary for you to see the Lord do a powerful work in your life today. Your need and His power. They came from everywhere. You see where they originated. Note also why they congregated. We've already preached and taught all around this. They're gathering because Jesus is performing signs and wonders. And again, while I cannot at all blame them, I also cannot totally praise them for the full counsel of God, the whole record will indicate they were coming just for the temporal and not for the eternal. They were only interested in what Jesus could do for them for the nasty now and now. They were not interested in what He would do for them for the by and by. And that raises a question for us today. Why why are you here? Why do you follow the Lord Jesus? Why did you come to have an encounter with Christ? Is it because you recognize you've got a spiritual need? Or are you here primarily for the physical Need. And, and one of the best ways to find out is to ask yourself and watch your own life. What happens in your soul when Jesus does not do for you in the now what you ask Him to do for you in the now? You see, to be a real follower of Jesus, you say, Lord, I am asking you to heal my wife. But even if you don't, I'm staying with you. Lord, I'm asking you to pay this bill, meet that need, do this mighty work. But even if you don't, that's not why I've come to you. I'm come to you because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and you're the only one 
who can really do what I need doing down in my soul. This is illustrated in the ministry of Jesus in John chapter 6 at the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible says that after that, the crowd came to Jesus again. They said, do that bread thing again. And Jesus said, you want the bread that God has sent down from heaven? I'm the bread that God has sent down from heaven. It's me. He said, you, you, you want to have eternal life? You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And even though that's a confusing statement, what he is saying is if you really want the bread that God has provided, it's not bread for the temporal need of the stomach. It's bread for the eternal need of the soul. And in John chapter 6, the crowd that had followed him and shouted his praise turned around and deserted him. Jesus turned to his own disciples and said, they're all leaving. Are you going to leave too? And it was there that Simon Peter said, where else are we going to go? You are the one that have the words of eternal life. What we really need, Jesus, can come from you and you alone. That's why they congregated and connected to that is what they illustrated. As we will see in the chapters to come, they will follow the Lord to a mountainside. They will listen to Him preach. They will hang around for some more signs and wonders, but they will prove themselves to be as fickle as a schoolgirl's crush, and it won't be long before they've left Him. It is a closing reminder to us in this message to never base a ministry on size and statistics. Some of y'all didn't hear what I just said. Never base a ministry on size and statistics. If we have 2,000 people here next Sunday, do you know what you know? All you know is that there were 2,000 people here. A dog and pony show can draw a crowd. If we mark a hundred baptisms this church here, do you know what you know for a fact? All you know for a fact is that a hundred people went through the baptistry. There's only one standard by which you judge the faithfulness of a ministry. Obedience to Jesus. Faithfulness to His Word. Did you do what Jesus told you to do? There was a song that came out years ago called People All Over the World. And it was one of the first Christian videos. I was raised in the MTV generation. And some Christian artists in that time started making videos, uh, song videos. And in this particular video, a dad was sitting at his desk at home. He was doing some work. And his little boy came to him, five, six-year-old boy, came to him and, Dad, can we go play? And the dad said, I've got to finish this work. And the little boy kept coming back and bothering him. And the dad said, i tell you what. And the dad reached over to a, a, a Bible coloring book, ripped a page out of that coloring book, and it was a picture of, the, of, of a globe. It was a picture of the nations of the world. And the daddy ripped that paper up into tiny little pieces, handed it to the boy with, a, with, with, a, uh, with some scotch tape, and said, son, daddy's got to finish his work. If you'll go put this picture of the world back together, tape it all together. By the time you get done with that, I'll be finished and we'll go play. Well, the little boy was gone, and in just a moment, he came back and he was finished. The daddy was surprised that such a little boy was able to put a picture of the world together so quickly. He said, how did you do that so fast? He said, well, before you tore it up, I saw there was a picture of Jesus on the other side of that page. And I was able to put the picture of Jesus together, and when I put Jesus together, the world fell into place. I don't know what's happening in your world. I don't know what's happening under your ministry. But I can tell you this. If you'll follow the model for ministry and put Jesus in place, everything else will fall into its place.